This is Michael Alea, and I'm going to be discussing ACL in terms of boards review. This is a very commonly tested subject, both on the ABOS part one examination as well as the in-service examination. So we'll briefly start with the anatomy of the anterior cruciate ligament. This is primarily composed of type one collagen, which is arranged in non-parallel fibers. And the ACL has two bundles named for their tibial insertion, the anteromedial bundle and the posterolateral bundle. The blood supply, similar to the PCL, is the middle genicular artery, and the innervation of the ACL comes from the posterior articular nerve. In terms of the ACL footprint, this is something very commonly tested and quite important. It's on the posterior medial wall of the intercondylar notch at the lateral femoral condyle. It's primarily originating posterior to Blumensatz line, and bony landmarks, which are often assessed, are the lateral intercondylar ridge, in which the ACL is supposed to sit completely but behind, as well as the lateral bifurcate ridge, which separates the ACL into the two bundles. In terms of the tibial anatomy, it's about 15 millimeters posterior to the anterior border of the tibial articular surface and about 9 millimeters posterior to the intermeniscal ligament, and that's in terms of the center of the ACL footprint. This is an oval shaped footprint on the tibia, and it's longer than it is wider. So it's about 17 millimeters long and about 11 millimeters wide from medial to lateral. And these have been shown in good studies by Ferretti. In terms of the biomechanics of the anterior cruciate ligament, there's an anterior medial and a posterior lateral bundle. The anterior medial bundle is relatively taut throughout range of motion. However, the posterior lateral bundle is certainly tighter in extension. In full extension, the two bundles of the ACL are actually in parallel. If you see the picture on the bottom left, the posterior lateral and the anterior medial bundles are perfectly parallel. However, when the knee bends to about 90 degrees of flexion, the bundles cross over and you could see this X type configuration. Again, please notice the origination and insertion of the ligament on the femur and the tibia in terms of the anterior medial bundle as well as the posterior lateral bundle. In terms of biomechanics, even further, the ACL acts as a very important restraint to anterior translation of the tibia relative to that of the femur. It's also a very important restraint to internal tibial rotation. Both the anteromedial and posterolateral bundles contribute to anterior and rotational stability. Moving into a little bit of basic science, uh, one of the main problems with the ACL is that there's very poor primary healing after a tear. The ligament is intraarticular, but it's encased in a thin envelope of synovial lining. And when this tears, uh, you really don't get any significant tissue healing, which leads to incompetent ACL. The ACL, as we know, is often injured, most predominantly in our younger population who plays contact sports, and it's certainly more common in women, anywhere from four to eight times uh, the prevalence in terms of women in terms of men, and this has to do with a lot of factors. Some of these factors include the anatomy. Females have wider pelvises, an increased Q angle, and a smaller femoral notch. And in terms of neuromuscular control, Females tend to have increased activation of the quadriceps relative to the hamstrings. And this uh, lack of neuromuscular control can very often contribute to the high prevalence of ACL tears in females. The mechanism of ACL tears are very often the result of an indirect non-contact injury, anywhere from 80 to 90%. A sudden cut and pivot or a land from a jump with the knee in an inappropriate position. Less commonly, there's direct contact, which is more often a hyperextension and valgus stress. Patients often feel and hear a pop and they develop a relatively rapid hemarthrosis. This doesn't mean that this happens in everybody. There's certainly patients who develop a very small hemarthrosis. Uh, they don't feel a pop, they don't hear a pop, but they certainly have a tear. 
I always tell the residents and the fellows that if anybody presents to the office or to the emergency room with an acute effusion after their injury, you have to suspect an intraarticular injury, and these patients often need some sort of imaging, uh, an x-ray and an MRI are both often uh, in indicated in combination. So in assessing knee stability, the two most common tests for the ACL are the Lachman test and the pivot shift maneuver. There's certainly other tests out there like the anterior drawer. You can integrate a KT1000 or a KT2000 into your practice. However, the Lachman and the pivot shift are certainly the most important to um, physical examination maneuvers. The pivot shift is a great measurement of anterolateral rotatory instability it's because the knee is going to sit subluxated anteriorly, particularly the lateral tibial plateau. And when you pivot the knee, it actually reduces the tibia. So here's an examination uh, in terms of the Lachman examination. The knee is flexed to about 30 degrees with relaxation of the hip. And you can see there's increased translation and usually you have to compare this to the contralateral side, but again, the key is to keep the knee at 30 degrees of flexion. The pivot shift exam evaluates for rotational instability. The surgeon or the, or the, the PA applies a valgus force with axial loading and internal rotation. And what happens is the tibia will sit subluxated in full extension with that maneuver and then reduce at about 20 to 30 degrees of flexion. It often presents with a glide or sometimes a more significant clunk, and it's usually based on a grade 3 scale, with grade 1 being just a subtle glide. Obviously, when the ACL tears, there's very often other ligamentous injuries as well, particularly and most commonly the medial collateral ligament, sometimes the LCL as well as the PCL, so these have to be assessed. Regarding imaging, we look for associated injuries, particularly the Sagan fracture, which, which is an avulsion of a piece of bone off the anterior lateral tibial plateau. Most often, the lateral capsule will avulse this piece. Sometimes a little piece of the IT band uh, can, can rip off a piece of bone as well. You really should not confuse this with an arcuate fracture, which is an LCL avulsion injury of the proximal aspect of the fibular head. Sagan fractures tend to have a more vertical fracture line and are relatively non-displaced. Pellegrini steata lesion is another bony injury that you can see in a chronic MCL injury as evidenced by the picture on the bottom. You can look for loose bodies, fractures, degenerative disease, as well as subtle anterior tibial translation, which is not often found on x-rays in patients with acute ACL tears. Patients with an ACL tear are going to be indicated for an MRI, and what we're lo really looking for are all three cuts in combination. You can't really just rely on a sagittal view, uh, T2 weighted image, to really rely on to really make the diagnosis of an ACL tear. And honestly, um, in communication with several musculoskeletal radiologists, we actually find that the axial and the coronal cuts are most specific for ACL ruptures. We'll often see bone bruises at the lateral side of the femur. Uh, po um, distally as well as in the posterior lateral tibia. Sometimes we see bone contusions as well on the medial tibial plateau posteriorly. And if you see a medial tibial plateau injury, you have to be somewhat suspicious that there might be a ramp lesion as well. Uh, and this has just been studied and, and, and published in the American Journal of Sports Medicine. And then we often see discontinuity of the ACL. Sometimes the ACL will sit in an abnormal orientation. It will be more horizontalized. Sometimes on MRI, we actually can see anterior tibial translation, and this is usually most common in chronic injuries. And then a hyperbuckled PCL, where the PCL sits at sort of a 90-degree angle and makes a kink halfway through, and we see that somewhat often in ACL. For treatment of ACL injuries, we can certainly, with most injuries, treat this non-operatively. The indication for non-operative management would be an asymptomatic, relatively low-demand athlete. We can modify their activities to reduce the amount of cutting and pivoting that they undergo in their daily living. You can give them a rehabilitation protocol, which emphasizes hamstring strengthening and really tries to make equivalent that quadriceps to hamstring ratio. Functional braces are not entirely necessary, but uh, it's been anecdotally shown that patients might feel less sense of instability, but functional braces really have no long-term effect on functional scores.
And we know from long-term studies by Frank Noyes that some people can certainly tolerate an ACL deficient knee, the rule of thirds, which was previously described. However, we know that episodes of instability, the more they recur, the more damage you're going to do to other critical structures of the knee, particularly the meniscus and the cartilage. Levy in 2003 looked at a 10-year study and found that patients who had subjective instability over 10 years had an 80% chance, 80% uh, risk of a uh, meniscus pathology as compared to those uh, with relatively short-term follow-up. So in terms of reconstruction and surgery, it's very We've often looked at preoperative milestones for determining whether a patient can proceed safely to the operating room. And we used to think it was a matter of time, but now we know it's a matter of having a biologically quiet knee. Sometimes that can happen in three days. Sometimes that can happen in a month and a half. But what we're really looking for is full knee extension with the absence of any kind of lag during a straight leg raise. We want to significantly reduce their effusion. Hopefully it will be absent and we want their quadriceps index to be about 90% of the contralateral side. However, we do understand that if patients have meniscus tears, such as a bucket handle meniscus tear, that would limit the patient's full knee extension. There's really no way you're going to get full knee extension uh, unless that reduces or unless they're able to cope with it. So these are obviously patients that that treatment algorithm goes out the window. We do these a as soon as possible and often would do the ACL and the meniscus at the same time. For the surgical approach of ACL tears, there's lots of different options out there, including graft choice, uh, the drilling options, anterior medial drilling, outside in, transtibial. You should know about all of them, but know that there's relatively no clinical differences between any of the kind of drilling options that you have. You will see biomechanical differences uh, in terms of the stability of the knee depending on where you put it. However, clinical outcomes have certainly not drawn significant conclusions in terms of anterior medial versus uh, transtibial drilling for the femur. Graft tension, some people tense, tension the graft at zero, some people at 30 degrees, and then graft fixation, there's lots of options on the table. Regarding graft options, uh, we either choose autograft or allograft, and there's the options for autograft include bone patella tendon bone, hamstrings, and quadriceps. We really want to make sure we have at least 8 millimeters of tissue. 8 millimeters has really been shown to be that critical number, uh, where if you have less than that, the chances of retear are certainly a lot higher. Quadriceps autograft is gaining some traction in the literature. However, none of the uh, choices for autograft have really proven significant superiority over the others. In terms of allograft, there's lots of options at the table, but again, you want to make sure that your graft is safe, uh, that it's really minimally or if not or, or zero irradiation because that's, because this can certainly affect the structure of the graft. And we really want to be careful not to choose too big of an allograft because this could lead to impingement and loss of motion. I'm not going to go over this slide in detail, but it just discusses part of the things about graft selection, uh, inclu including the uh, biological healing, as well as the morbidity uh, imposed to the patient when you're choosing each particular kind of graft. So there's lots and lots of literature on ACLs as well as failure. And if you look at the most long-term studies, we do know there's a little bit of a higher failure rate with hamstrings compared to bone, patella tendon bone, and there's lots of uh, long-term database studies out there, uh, particularly from Scandinavia that can show this. Uh, but again, we want to make sure there's at least eight millimeters of tissue. It's relatively unclear as to whether or not the addition of an allograft, this quote-unquote hybrid graft, increases the failure rate. We, don't, we do know that irradiation does increase allograft failure rate. And any kind of allograft in a young contact athlete, particularly less than 25 years old, is certainly going to have a higher failure rate than autograft. And this has been borne out by many studies. The general consensus is not to use an allograft in a high energy contact athlete less than 25 years old. In terms of infection rate, hamstrings has been shown to have a slightly higher infection rate than BTB. That might be caused of uh, the dead space to the soft tissue envelope over that area of the tibia. However, we should be somewhat more cautious uh, in terms of these patients because this has the literature.
Regarding tunnel placement, as we know, there's many different uh, methods to drill the tunnels for an ACL. You can do the transtibial technique in which the femoral placement of the tunnel relies on the tibial placement. The tibial tunnel is drilled first, then you place a guide through that tunnel onto the femur. However, with this method, it is relatively difficult to get anatomic location of the femoral footprint. And that's why people have transitioned to either outside in drilling or anteromedial portal drilling. When we drill through the anterior medial portal, we can more readily reproduce the footprint uh, on the ACL in the femur, and biomechanical studies have shown some improved rotational and translational stability when you do it this in this manner. However, clinical outcomes and clinical differences between the two have certainly not been borne out, and our own group has published literature in uh, clinical orthopedics and related research um, about comparing anterior medial versus transtibial drilling. And then we have the outside-in technique where the femoral tunnel is certainly drilled separately uh, than the, the tibial tunnel, and this is done using a, a retrograde uh, drilling guide. In terms of graft fixation, there's many different options on the table. Direct fixation relies on compressing the graft against the host bone, and this is often done with an interference screw. When we talk about divergence, that's the angle of the screw compared to that of the graft. The more the screw diverges away from the graft, the less stable and the less, um, the less biomechanically sound that fixation is going to be. We usually say there's anywhere between 20 to 30 degrees of divergence is acceptable, but obviously we'd like to be collinear. Bone staples can be used as well, particularly for soft tissue grafts. Sometimes they can be used for BTB grafts as well. If you make a little trough in the tibia and place the bone graft into that trough, as well as spiked washer and screw constructs for cortical fixation. Then we have other methods of uh, indirect fixation as well, um, which again are, are the spiked washers that we talked about if you're using a, as a post. Um, and then cross pins uh, using a... Um, uh, knotless suture anchor, as well as cortical buttons, uh, this quote-unquote graft link uh, technique, uh, technique to prefer an all-inside ACL reconstruction. In terms of preventing ACL injuries, uh, we talked about it in the other lecture that I made about sports rehabilitation, so I would ask you to look at this slide as well as look at the slide from the other talk that we gave. But then we have to talk a little bit about failure because this is something that's often tested on the boards. And we like to break it down into things that we can control and things that we can't control. In terms of things that we can control, we can certainly control the surgical technique as well as the placement of the tunnel. We can talk about graft choices. We have to understand concomitant pathology as well as the meniscus and the collateral ligaments as important stabilizers of the knee to prevent further ACL failure. And we have to know about alignment. Varus in particular is quite poor uh, and is poorly tolerated by an ACL reconstructed knee. Then there's things that we really can't control, including patient factors. Are they going to be compliant with their rehabilitation? Are they smokers? Graft factors in terms of how you prepare the graft or whether or not it's an allograft, how is the allograft prepared, and then infections and arthrofibrosis. Sometimes it's certainly a combination of multiple reasons why ACL fails. Now classically, the number one reason for ACL failure is going to be surgeon error, in particular placement of the tunnels. In the past, uh, we tended to make our femoral tunnel way too anterior. As you can see in this x-ray image, this is a cortical button fixation of an ACL. And if you look at the start of the ACL tunnel, the whole tunnel starts anterior to Blumensatz line, which is certainly excessively anterior and would lead to a rotationally unstable graft. So tunnel placement is classically the number one reason for ACL failure. An anteriorly placed femoral tunnel will lead to rotational laxity, as we previously discussed. However, you can certainly have tibial-sided errors as well. If the tibial tunnel is not placed anatomically, that could lead to impingement on the femur, and that could lead to reduced range of motion, rubbing up of the graft against the uh, bony prominences, which could lead to graft attenuation, 
And if the tibial tunnel is placed too posterior, you can certainly have PCL impingement, particularly with the knee inflection. If you want to be critical about your tunnels, for the femur, you can look at the method described by Bernard and Hertel, uh, in which a box is placed just posterior to the Blumensatz line. And you can read the parameters on the right. You can pause this slide. But what we really want to see is a tunnel relatively close to this area in red, which is described on the Bernard and Hertel grid. In terms of looking at the tibial tunnel and the correct location, we typically use uh, a method that was described by Steibli, um, in which we look at the depth of the proximal tibia. Um, what, roughly what we want to see is the center of the native ACL should be roughly 42% of the distance from anterior to posterior along that proximal tibia. This is a, a case of an ACL tear that failed that presented to our office. You can see the femoral tunnel certainly starts a little bit anterior and a little bit distal uh, when we're being critically um, evaluative uh, using the method of, of Bernard and Hertel. And this is where you would like to see your tunnel start as evidenced by the yellow dot. In terms of the meniscus, we have to understand its role as a secondary stabilizer of the knee. We've got lots of studies from Pittsburgh showing the meniscus to be a very important secondary stabilizer to anterior translation. And ACL forces in a graft can increase up to 33 to 50% after a medial meniscectomy. We also want to be aware of the meniscus ramp lesion as well because these are often missed on MRI and often missed intraoperatively. What I typically tell the residents and fellows is that we always want to establish the Gilquist position just underneath the PCL. You can evaluate this with a 30 degree or a 70 degree arthroscope. And if you look on the right, you can see the posterior horn of the medial meniscus and on the left are capsular attachments and you can see the, the clear detachment of the meniscus from the capsular attachments. And these uh, typically will increase the graft forces on the ACL and this was um, really studied first often uh, by the University of Connecticut with Corey Edgar and Bob Arciero showing uh, tibial translation and ACL strain can certainly increase when you have the presence of a meniscus ramp lesion. Regarding concomitant pathology as well, the, the collateral ligaments in the corners are extremely important, both the medial collateral as well as the posterior la uh, lateral corner. We know that ACL tension increases as lateral joint line opening increases, so varus is very bad. Posterior lateral instability and insufficiency is very bad as well. The iliotibial band can certainly play an important role, and it does play an important role for rotational stability. And there's lots of studies out there from Europe as well as America. Uh, I encourage you to look at uh, studies out of the University of Pittsburgh with Freddie Fu and Volker Musal, uh, who have really done excellent work on, on evaluating the importance of the iliotibial band, the deep capsulo osseous structures, as well as the Kaplan fibers, um, to really show how important the anterolateral structures are with regard to rotational stability. We have to talk about the anterolateral capsule, the anterolateral ligament as well, because these, this does play a role as well. And attenuation in these two structures can certainly cause increased graft forces, particularly with rotational stability. So I would very um, much encourage you to read some of the great biomechanical work that they've put out. Regarding alignment, we have to understand that the coronal plane as well as the sagittal plane are both incredibly important. Uh, varus, we know, is very poor uh, with regard to ACL forces because the more varus you have in the knee, the more force you're going to have in that ACL graft. Uh, this was initially studied by Van de Poel, and this is the graph. Uh, the graph on the right is from their study, uh, showing that in full knee extension, when you have significantly increased varus, where the weight-bearing line falls outside of the compartment, there's a significant increase in ACL tension with 300 newtons of axial loading. When we talk about the sagittal plane, the picture below is very, very important to understand. As we increase the tibial slope, we increase the strain in the ACL. The picture down uh, on the bottom is very important for understanding this rollback mechanism, whereas if the tibial slope is too elevated, meaning it's too much of a slope, it's too much of a hill, the femur will want to roll back down on that hill and that will stretch out the ACL. 
We often see in patients that have failed multiple ACL reconstructions without any other source of instability like a meniscus tear or collateral ligament damage that they might have an elevated tibial slope, which is not going to, excuse me, which is going to cause uh, significant increases in creep and strain on the graft, and that graft will just attenuate over time. So you have to understand that an osteotomy to reduce the slope can certainly be indicated in these types of patients. The reverse holds true for PCL injuries. A relatively flat slope or even uh, an improperly uh, oriented slope where the slope is angled anteriorly is going to increase the strain on the PCL. 30 degrees. 30 degrees. So in terms of the failed ACL preoperative evaluation, we want to understand the history of the patient. What was the time from the surgery to the re-injury? If it was very early, that could, um, that could make you think about a failure of fixation. Uh, injury mechanism, did they just step off a curb the wrong way? Did it just become unstable over time? Or did they have a discrete injury where the patient had another pivoting injury or a valgus force injury? Does the patient have pain, which might be indicative of a cartilaginous or a meniscal lesion? And you have to really understand the patient's goals and expectations because oftentimes patients will not want to undergo significant revision surgery, especially in combination with other procedures, um, and they might just decide to alter their daily activities and alter their exercises to reduce the chances of recurrent instability. In terms of the physical examination, we always have to assess the patient's muscle girth and tone, make sure they don't have a significant discrepancy from one side to the contralateral side. You want to evaluate their gait and look particularly for varus thrust, which might lead you to believe the patient is sitting in varus and has some posterior lateral laxity. Really pay attention to the corners and the collateral ligaments, do a good physical examination, and always look at the patient's alignment. Standing alignment is very critical, and you have to get alignment films, in my opinion, in all patients with an ACL. So what's really the fuss about revision ACL surgery? We know that technically they're certainly more challenging and the outcomes are not as ideal as evidenced by the MARS group. The risk of failure is anywhere between three and four times that higher of a primary ACL reconstruction. And we know from Rick Wright's work that they have lower outcome scores. There's also a lower return to sport as well. There's increased meniscus and chondral injury, as well as psychosocial aspects of fear and hesitancy. And there's certainly a higher reoperation rate than that of a primary ACL reconstruction. And one of our former residents, Dave Ding, presented this uh, from the Mars group. In terms of two-staging it, if there's really any doubts, uh, I always tell people to stage it, and this could be tunnels placed well with expansion, tunnels placed all right, but you want them better, or any patient with significant hardware issues. But in terms of testability, what you need to know is that the results are, have been shown to be similar to that of one staging. That being said, there's really no good randomized studies out there looking at major bone loss in terms of one versus two stages. Generally, we have a consensus saying that tunnels that are more than 15, 14 or 15 millimeters should potentially be two-staged, or you should certainly think about two-staging those patients. Um, but obviously, the bone needs to be incorporated prior to the revision. What I always do is scope the knee first right before harvesting the graft just to make sure that the bone is integrated and make sure that we're not going to basically be reaming into mush and get very poor fixation of a revision ACL surgery. In terms of getting an x-ray or a CT scan, there's really no consensus in the literature as well, but what we usually say is that the revision could be anywhere from three to six months uh, status post the uh, bone grafting procedure. And there's lots of bone graft options on the table, including autograft as well as allograft. Most people use allograft. You can either use bone dowels, demineralized bone matrix, sometimes little wedges and, and, um, and uh, matchstick type procedures can be done with allograft. Uh, it's extraordinarily rare to have to bone graft with autograft. Thankfully, these tend to incorporate very well. Um, so this is the end of the talk on ACL reconstruction surgery uh, and ACLs. Hopefully, this has gone over most of the testing material. You can always free, feel free to get in contact with me if you have any questions or if something is not well understood. Thank you for your attention.